Hi there everybody and welcome to Neurotalks this evening. It's really great to see such a, a wonderful turnout uh, this evening to our, to our um, event here for Mental Health Week and a great privilege to be here with you all today. Before I start, um, I want to uh, tell you who I am and why I'm here um, and also to talk about my passion for mental health research. I'm a senior research fellow here at Neura and I've been studying the genetics of major psychiatric illnesses for the past 15 years or so. In my family, we have a strong family history of depression and a number of my relatives, including myself, have been treated with antidepressants over our, over our lives. Does anyone else here in the room have a family member, friend or work colleague who suffers from a mental illness? Yeah. <laughs> So then each of you know what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying when, I can, when I'm telling you how devastating having a mental illness can be and how, how much of a huge impact that this can have, not only on the person who's, who's suffering the condition, but also their friends and family and loved ones. It was through my experience of mental illness that I wanted to better understand its biological basis, reduce the stigma associated with mental illness, and improve outcomes for people living with these conditions. I wanted to start off my talk today with some exciting news. In the last month, my team was awarded a $2.46 million grant from the New South Wales Government to unravel the genetics of bipolar disorder by sequencing the genome of 1,200 people with bipolar disorder in New South Wales. What is the genome, I hear you, I hear you ask? Well, <laughs> I heard you ask it. <laughs> the genome is your DNA sequence. This is the, this is the, um, the chemical that you inherit from your, your parents when, when you come into being. And the genome you can think of as, as a book. So it's a very, very large book. So when you, when you talk about the sequence that makes up your genome, you can, if you write it down into, into words, um, sentences and paragraphs, it tells a story. This story um, contains inf instructions on how to make you a human being um, and also gives you per your physical, um, particular physical and personal characteristics. So if you think about the largest book um, that comes to, comes to mind, the, the largest book that came to my mind was Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. Huge book. This book contains about three million letters. The human genome comprises about three billion letters. So this story, the genome story, is about 1,000 times the length of War and Peace, this epic, epic novel. Sometimes in the genome story, a letter is changed or some punctuation is removed or added which changes the meaning of the sentence. Sometimes entire paragraphs are removed or entire pages are removed or duplicated, which changes the genome story in, in, a, in particular people. This new grant that we've been awarded will enable us to closely examine the genome story of bipolar disorder, to better understand what causes it and to provide clues as to better how to, how to treat it. So the key points for my talk today, firstly, what is bipolar disorder? Secondly, what causes bipolar disorder? Thirdly, I'd like to give you an overview of the latest research discoveries that our team have been involved with. And fourthly, um, I wanted to propose the question of whether we can use what we know about bipolar disorder to predict who might become ill in future. So firstly, what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is a debilitating psychiatric condition affecting around 1 to 4% of the world's population. This equates to around 250,000 Australians living with this, this condition. This graph represents the, um, the different phases of, of the condition, um, ranging from the depressive phase to manic phase here. And down on the right side of the slides here, I've got some 
um, artwork that have been taken from the Cunningham Dax collection of psychiatric art. And these artworks have been painted by people with, with psychiatric conditions and represent the different phases of the, of the condition. So up here at the very top, we have a, a sunny day, beautiful blue skies, um, and this represents euthymia, the period where people have a, a stable mood, and um, yeah, stable mood. At the, in the middle here, we have um, a representation of depression. We have, it's dark, it's scary. We have dark thoughts, loss of energy and loss of enjoyment in life. And at the bottom here, we have a representation of mania where we might experience racing thoughts, increased energy and flights of idea, and sometimes accompanied by hallucinations and delusions. Around 80% of the risk of bipolar disorder is genetic, and patients um, who, uh, the offspring of people with bipolar disorder have an eight to tenfold increased risk of developing bipolar disorder as well. People with bipolar disorder tend to have family members who are also affected with mental illness. And this may present in the form of bipolar disorder as well, or in, in the form of the related mental um, conditions that are associated with it, such as schizophrenia, major depression, or schizoaffective disorder. So we've touched on, in terms of what causes bipolar disorder, we've touched on um, the genetic predisposition, but there are other elements that, can, that contribute to um, onset of bipolar disorder as well. And these include um, exposures in the prenatal environment, um, through maternal infection or, or experience of stress in, in utero before a child is born. Um, and they can also be experienced at, at sort of neurodevelopmental effects uh, in childhood or um, in adolescence, where again, exposure to stress is a big, is a big factor, um, but also diet and drug exposure can come into play in terms of um, risk factors for, on, um, for future illness. And these exposures then can lead to an improper balance of brain chemicals, which then result in the brain structure and functional changes, and then finally culminate in men mental illness. Great advances have been made in the field of psychiatric genomics in recent years, with international collaborative efforts through the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. In 2011, a landmark study was published in which we examined genes which contribute to bipolar disorder in a large sample of around 7,500 cases of bipolar disorder and compared these to 9,250 um, um, control individuals from the general population. And we looked to examine the uh, common spelling differences between people with bipolar disorder and people who don't have bipolar disorder to see if we could identify genes which increase risk. And this analysis, uh, the results of this analysis is shown here in the, on this graph. And you can see the chromosomes um, along here. So there are 23 chromosomes indicated by the alternating blue colours. Um, and on the on the uh, vertical axis here we have the significance of the association to the condition. And you can see along here there's a dotted red line and this, that red line is very important. That indicates uh, a, a significance value for the association of the gene. So if a, um, a locus exceeds this red line, we've discovered a gene for bipolar disorder. So this analysis has actually identified four genes which increase risk to bipolar disorder, which was very exciting to have this, um, this clue into the architecture, the genetic architecture of this condition. However, there were many other signals in this, in this data which indicated that there were many more genes yet to discover. And so we, the idea is that if we can increase the numbers of samples that are going into these analysis, we're, go we're going to be able to identify many, many, many more genes. And this um, was uh, conducted 
for schizophrenia, in term, which is a related uh, psychiatric condition which has an overlapping genetic uh, contribution. Um, and in this study, which was published in 2014, there was uh, almost 37,000 cases with schizophrenia who were analysed in this study and 113,000 controls. And this was the result. Astonishingly, we're now seeing, you can see the red um, genome-wide significance line down here, and you can see all of these green peaks appearing above this significance threshold line. So we are now um, identifying 108 genes which increase risk to schizophrenia through, through this study. Interestingly, this locus here on chromosome 6 represents the um, human leukocyte antigen uh, locus, which is an immune gene. So just thinking back into the context of Cindy's talk um, that you've just heard, the immune system is, is playing a huge role here in the, at, at the genetic level as well. So this year we're about to publish another study, um, which is a, a larger study in, in, in bipolar disorder. Um, comprising about 20,000 cases of bipolar disorder and 31,000 controls. And again, we're identifying new genes. So we've got 18 new genes which increase risk to bipolar disorder. So we're really getting some traction here in terms of um, being able to identify new genes and understanding what the gene risk factors are for, for this condition. So the take home points of this, um, this part of the talk is that there are many genes which increase risk to bipolar disorder. It's certainly not a single gene. We've got many genes which are acting in concert to increase uh, genetic risk. And these individual genes have very small individual effects on risk. Um, and we need bigger studies with many more um, samples and many more DNA samples from, um, from patients to find more genes. I also wanted to talk about the efforts of the Consortium of Lithium Genomics because this is really important in terms of our um, ability to deliver personalised medicine to um, people with bipolar disorder in future. So as a lot of you probably know, um, lithium is a medicine that's a first line treatment in the, um, in the treatment of bipolar disorder and it's primarily used to, to prevent manic episodes and suicide attempts. However, individual responses to this medication are highly variable. So if you have 10 people with bipolar disorder in a room who are all receiving lithium, you might see that three, these three people represented in the dark blue will respond very well to this drug. They will, they will have remission of symptoms and they will, they will be functioning very well with this, um, with this treatment. However, three, the three people represented here in light blue will um, only partially respond to the drug. So they may have some symptom remission, but certainly is, it, it's certainly not curing them of, their, of their, con their condition. And we'll have four people who remain in black here who don't respond to this drug at all and need to go through the process of going on to another drug and then another drug and then another drug to try and work out what is actually going to give them relief of their symptoms. And we do not know why lithium is effective in some people and not in others. And at the moment, we, can also, we, we also cannot predict which particular individuals um, will benefit from treatment with lithium. And this is the focus of Conligen. So the Consortium of Lithium Genomics is a large international collaboration um, with groups around the world working towards this, this objective, including us down here in Australia. So the phase one analysis of Conligen um, used the um, DNA from 2,500 um, patients across 22 participating sites around the world with um, information on their lithium response profiles. And last year, we um, identified a region on chromosome 21, the first locus which has ever been identified which influences responsiveness to, to lithium. So this is a great advance in our, in our understanding of um, the genetic architecture underpinning lithium response. But like with the, the graphs that I showed you earlier, there were many more genes left to find under the, that genome-wide significance threshold. 
um, before we can potentially offer this as, as um, in, for individualised medicine. So the goal of phase two of Conligen is to recruit and analyse another 3,500 new subjects to further gene discovery. Now, I want to then now change tack a little bit to say, you know, can we use what we know about bipolar disorder to predict illness in, in young people who may be at increased risk? So currently one of the best predictors of bipolar disorder, a future risk of bipolar disorder, is a positive family history. But this is very, very non-specific. So one of the goals of our Kids and SIB study is to try and identify whether we can um, predict at an individual level whether, an in, whether a person is likely to convert to bipolar disorder or who is on the trajectory towards bipolar disorder. So the Kids and SIB study is a 10 year longitudinal study where we're taking information on young people who are um, aged 12 to 30 years of age who all have a first degree relative, mostly a parent with bipolar disorder. And we follow them um, with clinical follow ups each year to look for emergence of symptoms and um, the trajectory that they're on. These participants have a tenfold increased risk of developing bipolar disorder themselves. So 10% of them will convert to bipolar disorder ultimately. On, here, on the right of the slide here, um, we have a little um, cartoon which was designed to encapsulate the concept of this study, which is really to catch people who are at risk of bipolar disorder before they fall ill. So I think that really nice, nicely demonstrates the, the goal that we're trying to achieve here. So the goal um, is that we want to use brain imaging, genetic and clinical data to see if we can predict future illness. So doing this, here is a representation of 55 at-risk female participants in our study. And what we've done is we've, we've been using an unsupervised clustering um, machine learning approach to see with whether we can identify patterns in the brain imaging data and the genetic data from these individuals to see if we can identify who is going to get ill in future. And in doing this analysis, we identify two groups of people, cluster group one and cluster group two. These individuals seem to be quite different in based in, on their brain structure and their, and their genotypes. So we wanted to ask the question, how, does, how do these groups um, relate to early clinical um, presentation of bipolar disorder? So anxiety disorders tend to appear earlier than um, a full diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So we wanted to look at the, the proportion of people in these subgroups that are experiencing anxiety, anxiety disorders. And we find that in group one, 52% of those young, young women uh, had an anxiety disorder as compared to 13% in cluster group two. When we look at the longitudinal follow-up data at eight years, we find that 22% of the individuals in group one have converted to bipolar disorder, as compared to 4% in cluster group two. This is really amazing um, finding because the, the, these clusters are based purely on brain imaging and genetic data and nothing else. So this is really exciting because it seems like we're able to identify these people early and before, any, before the um, trajectory to um, bipolar disorder has actually really commenced at the clinical level. So the take home points are that we may be able to use early, early changes in brain structure and genetic information to identify young at risk individuals who are more likely to develop bipolar disorder in future. Why is this important? Well, it can open up opportunities for us to introduce early treatments which may delay or even prevent these people ever getting ill. And this is really, really exciting. If we can identify them early enough, we might be able to actually do something really significant here. But further research is required to determine how well this prediction works. So this is um, work in progress that will be continuing in the next, uh, in the next few years. So the key messages from my talk are that bipolar disorder is a devastating mental illness caused in part by genetics. But recent advances in genomics technology 
and international collaborations have led to unprecedented advances in our understanding of the genetic risk factors for bipolar disorder. We now know that bipolar disorder is not caused by a single gene, but by the combination of many genes, mostly of small effect, and that these genes overlap across um, the phenotypic spectrum, so with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizophrenia and major depression. But this voyage of discovery that we are on right now will help us deliver personalised treatments which will improve the quality of life for people living with bipolar disorder. Thanks very much for listening.